when it comes to diabetes, there's so much to talk about, right? Because diabetes is not necessarily just one particular problem. It's a whole constellation of issues that can affect uh, a number of different organs, and then therefore they can affect different organ systems. And as a result of that, uh, diabetes can be a, a complex problem that has many different issues that can sort of one by one by one by one by one all be sort of repaired such that your overall glucose metabolism can start to function uh, in a non-diabetic manner. And one of those things is uh, that affects the way that people diabetes with diabetes regulate their blood glucose or even people without diabetes uh, who, that can cause higher blood glucose is sleep. And you are an expert here in the interaction between sleep and blood glucose management. So maybe let's start at the top and just give us an overview of what is the current state of sleep in our culture today? Well, you know, it's really interesting. And as you, uh, I just want to point out exactly, you're talking um, about like a system breakdown. And so the mistake we make in Western medicine with a system breakdown like diabetes is that we try to approach a system breakdown with like a single solution to try and insert one solution. And in Western medicine, it's medications to fix this entire system that's broken down and it just doesn't work. So, you know, managing the components of a system breakdown leads to a holistic solution. And um, that's why I love what you're doing because you approach things holistically. So you're absolutely right. Sleep is one of those important components. And as we'll hopefully see today, maybe more impo important than we realized in helping to manage blood sugar. And, you know, uh, over the last um, 50 years, the average person um, in America has reduced their sleep by 1.5 to 2 hours per night, which is remarkable. And today, more than 80 million Americans sleep in less than six hours a night. Now, you know, for many years, I was one of those people, uh, you know, med school residency training, six children. I had a lot of nights below six hours. So I was in that category. So by no, no means am I coming uh, with, you know, uh, kind of a prima donna attitude towards sleep. I have been sleep deprived for years. I'm actively working to improve my sleep because I, I realize how important it is. But we have a, a real problem with sleep deficit. And, you know, rather than fixing our sleep, we often try to compensate by adding in things like coffee uh, or, you know, um, drinks like Red Bull, where we're trying to boost and compensate for a poor night's sleep. But as we'll talk about a little bit later, it, it's doubling down on the problem rather than fixing the problem. Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're right. I didn't realize that there were actually 80 million Americans that get less than six hours of sleep per night. That's that's a big number. That's a really big number. And I think you're right in that, uh, you know, sleep, I don't know what they call it, sleep deprivation or uh, reduced uh, duration of quality sleep is something that's become very pervasive. And I think a lot of the problems when I talk to people about why they're not able to sleep or stay asleep for a long period of time, um, people give me one of two responses, either number one, I can't turn my brain off or right. number two. I'm an anxious person. I hear that left and right from people. And a lot of people living with some collection of chronic diseases, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, uh, it could be Alzheimer's disease, uh, it could be fatty liver disease, you name it. So um, give me a little bit more information here about like why is sleep so important? What is actually happening under the surface inside of your brain, inside of your digestive tissues, inside of your muscle, your, your liver, that is actually uh, beneficial and that allows sleep to be a very restorative process that's required for optimal health. Yeah, um, before we jump into sleep architecture, I'm just gonna talk about two quick studies that really highlight the importance of sleep and how it disrupts like every system. So we know, we all know shift workers. Uh, I was a shift worker in residency. And uh, when you, you know, when they examine shift workers who have disrupted their sleep, they find a number of really concerning trends. Number one, they find they have higher levels of inflammation, elevated CRP or C-reactive protein. They have higher um, insulin resistance. They have oxidative stress. Their reward centers in their brain are elevated and activated, and they have an increased uh, susceptibility to carbohydrate cravings. Their ghrelin is increased, and ghrelin is a a uh, hormone that's released that, released that actually increases our appetite and they have decreased leptin, which is an appetite suppressant. 
They have elevated cortisol levels and norepinephrine, which is kind of the stress hormones, which we know preferentially drives people to eat more carbohydrates. In shift workers, they found that there was a doubling of inflammation and insulin resistance in normal healthy populations. So we can see that, um, uh, you know, shift work gives us a little bit of a window into the disruption that we can see with um, well, a breakdown in our sleep architecture. And, you know, I always like to try and understand how the body should work when things are normal, because it really gives us um, a greater understanding of this incredible regenerative capacity that occurs during sleep. So <clears throat> our bodies have been wired to sleep based upon light dark cycles. It's called circadian rhythms. It's like a, a clock, an internal clock that's set by the rising of the sun and by the setting of the sun. And that happens because light enters our eye and it goes back through this, um, this area in the brain, which is a really big name that you won't be tested on. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN. It goes through that nucleus and that relays it to the brain and gives your uh, brain the cue to either turn on melatonin or turn off melatonin. And melatonin, when it's turned on with the dark, is a hormone that really uh, introduces sleep and helps to build a healthy sleep pattern at night. So <clears throat> that light-dark cycle is really important. It's kind of this whole category of research and science today called chronobiology, our bodies on a clock. And it maintains homeostasis or normal functioning. And for most of human history, when we didn't have electricity, we didn't have screens like we're looking at here, you know, it got dark at night and the campfire went out, we went to bed. And the sun came up, we got up. And so our bodies were naturally, um, uh, naturally synchronized with the light dark cycles. And all of those systems that we briefly talked about in those two studies were normal. But today, as we have, you know, introduced screens, we'll talk more about sleep hygiene at the end. It disrupts our sleep. It disrupts that whole light dark cycle. And we end up uh, shifting our sleep architecture. So normal sleep uh, is this, that we were wired for bedtime between 10 and 11. And we're normally supposed to get up around six or seven, which would put us in the seven to eight hour window. And we know that because when we look at the hormones that are released, we can really understand how sleep becomes a, regener a regenerative opportunity every night. Um, melatonin is released around, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10 p.m. And it starts rising and is elevated all the way to about 4 a.m., helping to really usher the body into a deep sleep cycle. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, you know, right about 11, we get this incredible spike of growth hormone released by the pituitary gland. Now, we all know, know growth hormone as, uh, you know, something that a bodybuilder would take and it builds big muscles and regenerates tissue. But your body naturally spikes growth hormone uh, between the hours of like 11 and 3 a.m. It's also the time when your body goes down into these deep sleep um, valleys of stage three, stage four sleep. And in those stage four, stage uh, uh, four sleep um, uh, cycles, we have these delta waves in our brain, which allows our brain to regenerate. We have blood flow to the muscles. We have reduction in inflammation. We have a regeneration of our immune system. We have repair of connective tissue. It's like your body rolls into the garage at night and all these little workers come out and fix everything and get it ready for the next day. And then it rolls out in the morning. And that happens only between 11 and 3 a.m. About 3 a.m., the body starts slowly preparing to wake up and we see a rise in cortisol, which really begins spiking at 6 a.m., which is the body's natural response to be prepared to get out of bed, to head out, to go to work, to get ready to organize your life. And so <clears throat> that architecture is hardwired and laid in. And no matter what we do to try and shift it one way or another, we cannot get around the fact that we, our bodies have been synchronized to light and dark. And if we try and cheat sleep, there are serious consequences. Well, this is actually a really good description. So, so go back to, you said that it's basically between 11 PM and three o'clock AM is when you're sort of in your optimal, uh, your optimal sleep zone where you can get as many of these restorative processes happening at the same time. Does it matter what time you go to sleep? In other words, if somebody goes to sleep at seven o'clock PM is the 11 to three o'clock period the same 
as if somebody went to bed at 10.55 p.m.? Or is it dependent on how much time has elapsed from when you fell asleep moving forward? Yeah, the, it appears like when we look at the, the way that your body releases the hormones, that it's, you know, you enter that deep sleep phase after 11 p.m. So as long as you're sleeping, you know, past 11, your body will drop right into that deep sleep. And if you go to bed at seven you're, uh, and you sleep until the morning, you're not getting up in the middle, you will uh, enter that deep, that deep sleep. Um, it becomes difficult for people that are awakened in the middle of the night. You know, they start to enter deep sleep and they're awakened. So they never get down into that stage three, stage four, and they will miss some of that regenerative reparative cycle. So that sleep hygiene, which we'll talk about at the end today, is really critical in, in getting to bed on time and um, teaching your body how to sleep uh, overnight.